So there's a cursory question I ask everyone. Could you introduce yourself and say what it is that you are known for? Sure. Uh, I'm Stu Jeffries. I am a 40-plus uh, year radio announcer, uh, currently doing the morning show with Boom 97.3 uh, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I've also got a history in television um, with several years of uh, national TV um, music experience, I guess, under my belt. So I'll just say a prisoner of the uh, TV and radio media. What is your earliest memory of television and or radio, whichever one you remember first? Yeah, you know what? I've always been, TV just kind of happened along in my career. It was never, never anything that I really actively pursued. It was more radio has always been my favorite. So my first memory of um, being in radio was um, I'm a, a family of four kids, uh, what single mom and four kids, and um, I was the middle child. We used to gather at our uh, in a small apartment in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I was raised, to uh, eat breakfast, and it was always complete confusion. My mother trying to get her coffee going and herself ready while getting her kids fed and off to school. But the one thing that I always remember is this tiny transistor radio uh, sitting on top of our bread box. It was this black thing. And she would have on her favorite radio station, which was uh, CJOB in Winnipeg. And I remember listening to the guy, the announcer, talk. And I remember thinking, even at a young age, I couldn't have been more than, I don't know, maybe eight or nine. Uh, and I remember thinking, he's like talking to me and talking to us. And he doesn't even know who we are. Like he's in our kitchen sharing breakfast with us. And, and like that is, that's like, but to me, that blew my mind. That and the fact that I used to think that all the, I didn't understand that they were playing records in studio. I thought the bands were just standing by and waiting to step up to the microphone to sing the next song. But I remember that being my earliest recollection and and just loving the concept so much. But I should say that I thought that it was for other people and not me. I I did not. If you had told me then when I was a kid that I could get a job doing that, I would have my my the back of my head would have exploded. That would have been you know amazing. It wasn't until I was older that I realized that maybe I've got a shot at it. What kind of jobs did you think you would have at a young age? Yeah, I, I remember I wanted to be a scientist, and then, you know, I wanted to be a private investigator, because the ones on TV looked like they had just like an amazing life. <laughs> that would be awesome. You know, but mostly, I, I guess I just didn't think that that would be, it, it obviously, it was something that I wanted to do, but I didn't think that it would be something I'd be able to. So, you know, I went off in fantasy land. I said I wanted to be a firefighter, um, uh, you know, a, 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 any number of things, uh, but I didn't actively pursue them. And I should say that I spent a lot of time, I used to get bronchitis a lot as a kid. And uh, so I spent a lot of time at home, away from school, sometimes for a couple of weeks on end. And I would never leave our bedroom, which I shared with my older brother. Uh, I never left bed because I was just afraid to go out. I was always afraid of things. So I just stayed in bed and I had the radio by my side and I would make my own charts and pretend that I was an announcer. And uh, that radio, man, that went to that like it went everywhere with me. I would sleep. I would be under my pillow at night. I'd be listening to the jocks talk and and um, waiting for my favorite song to be played. I always fall asleep with it on. What other hobbies did you have growing up? Uh, my family wasn't. We didn't have a lot of cash, so it wasn't a lot of money for hobbies. We sort of, as as kind of little house on the prairie as it sounds, we just sort of made our own fun. Um, so more times than not, it was just hanging with my friends. We did a lot of outside play, like a ton. And the usual stuff like baseball or road hockey, that sort of thing. But I can't say I had any serious hobbies. I guess radio was my hobby. That was the thing that I thought, you know, if I can't actually work in it, I'll just pretend I'm working in it. So that became kind of a passion of mine. Did you grow up in Manitoba? Yeah. I uh, My parents divorced when I was, I think, four, four or five or something like that. I never really knew my dad. And they were married in uh, Richmond, B.C. So my dad left when I was four. My mom packed us all up and took us to Winnipeg because that's where my grandmother and grandfather, her mom and dad were. So she was looking for some help in raising us. Could you talk about your formal education? Sure. High school until grade 12. And then the National Institute of Broadcasting, which is no longer in business. I, they had a, some sort of small operation set up uh, in downtown Winnipeg. So I graduated from there. And then, uh, then it was on. So in 1979, when I was 19 years old, that's uh, when I got my first job in radio. And what was that job? Uh, I was at CJGX in Yorkton, 940 on the dial. It was my first, <laughs> I should say this, I loved Winnipeg Radio. And my mission when I left, uh, or when I graduated from broadcasting, was to work in Winnipeg Radio, but I couldn't get it, because to be honest with you, I was terrible. But I had an audition tape ready, and you know, I was hoping for a break from somebody. I sent it out to, oh God, I, you know, I say 25 stations. I don't think that's an exaggeration, and I got pretty much rejection letters from all of them. They were kind enough to send me a rejection letter, which is nice. People don't even do that anymore. And then I got this uh, job in Yorkton uh, at 19 years old, and it just so it just so happened that 
I found out later that the program director that hired me, Jerry Lawrence, who's an Asian guy, said the reason why he hired me was he said he had just fired somebody and he went into his office and my tape was sitting on his desk. <laughs> so he said, I don't care what you sound like, you're hired. So it wasn't anything to do with sounds, I can assure you that. Breed of necessity. <laughs> That's right. When you were first on radio, did you have any kind of persona other than Stu Jeffries that you tried to affect? Uh, yeah, you, yeah, I tried to, you know, most of it, most of me, I was stealing from just about every announcer that I liked, uh, when I was growing up and listening to radio in Winnipeg. So, you know, there's names that will only mean something to people who were there with me, but my favorite radio station was CFRW, which was a hot hit radio station at the time. And there were jocks on there that I loved. Tim Ferguson was the guy that would do the all night show. Uh, Casey Fox was the guy that would do Drive. Dick Reeves was doing Mornings. So basically, I stole from all these guys and tried to sort of blend them all into what was going to be my persona. But, you know, it was god awful. I still have air checks from those days, which just, it's so funny because you can hear a guy struggling to figure out who the hell he wants to be, but can't quite get there. And I was just fortunate, you know, that I, I, was, I worked for a radio station that was used to that sort of talent, you know, running through, coming through town. More times than not, they were crappy, and they let you kind of find yourself, and they sort of guided you along a little bit. But I couldn't say I was any one person. I would say I was about 11 or 12 trying to figure out a one out of that bunch. And how long were you with CJGX? CJGX, yeah, about uh, a year and a half. So I, I got there in June of 79, left in November of 81. And then um, I was on my way some hour and 45 minutes up the road to Regina, which was the, uh, much was still is the uh, capital of Saskatchewan, to work at another hit radio station there on the AM dial at CJME. And were you uh, programming music in addition to being a talent, or were you, did you have playlists? Yeah, I, uh, I was talking about that. I was a music director in uh, Yorkton, so I was sort of the guy that was in, although music director in Yorkton was a bit of a toss up because it was a multi-format radio station, which was really funky because in the mornings they would play the morning guy, Ron Waddell, would come in and he would have sort of a mishmash of songs he'd play. He loved Elvis, so there would always be some Elvis. And then, uh, and some country, some adult contemporary, uh, lots of Canadian, all kind of mixed into one. And the same thing with the midday announcer, Mel. And then when middays was over, when the midday shift was over, it was like 5.30. They went into a pre-recorded, this was Monday, <laughs> Monday to Friday, they went into a pre-recorded show called The Ukrainian Hour which was only a half hour, which was a big joke. Uh, and it was just nonstop polka, so accordion and polka music and whatever. That would play for half an hour. You come out at 6 p.m. with funeral announcements because this is a small town and they only had a newspaper that was released once a week on Wednesday. So if somebody was dying, they had to know where the services were held and that. So twice a day, you did these funeral announcements. And then so after they were over at 6 o'clock, it just became this rocker, like this blowtorch. And I love rock and roll. And, and and if we played new music. So I basically kind of had the freedom to add whatever I wanted to until the program director would come in and say, why are we playing this song? But I, I got a chance to, you know, to really rock it out. In Regina, when I was the same music director there after a couple of years on air, and it was far more refined, and you had music meetings once a week, and you looked at charts, and you decided what was going to go in and what was going to go out. But <laughs> the most fun you can have is when you get free reign of the radio station, and you can add whatever you want. It's a blast. Did you ever have to worry about CanCon mandates? Yeah, we did. Uh, we didn't keep track in Yorkton, and only because we were so over, it was ridiculous. I mean, they played more Canadian music on that station than any station I'd ever been at. And as I say, things were far more refined in Regina. Uh, they, you know, monitored that stuff very closely. I think, if I'm not mistaken, we were required at the time to play 30% Canadian music from, and here's, here's the thing you used to try and do. 30% Canadian music, but they try and jam it into like the all-night show, right? And then CRTC, the governing body, kind of said, no, you can't do that anymore. And you can't stockpile your Canadian music. You can't wait until 10 o'clock at night to play two hours of Canadian music. It's got to be spread throughout. And I mean, it's funny, you know what? I never really understood that. I never liked that law to begin with, only because I thought if your music is good enough, it should be played anywhere. It shouldn't be because you're Canadian, you get a, a break. And in some cases, I think it's greed is mediocrity. And, and as a result, you were playing songs that maybe had no business being on the radio. But on the other hand, I love the opportunity that Canada has some great artists and a lot of them nobody would have heard of on the international scale, never mind locally, had it not been for Canadians. So, you know, I'm kind of a, a mixed thoughts about that. But yeah, so we had to, and you had to do it. And every so often, the CRTC would say, give us your program logs for, you know, Tuesday, blah, blah, blah. And they, they would play it from, from uh, midnight to whenever to make sure that we were actually uh, in compliance. 
What do you think are the qualities that make for a good disc jockey? Good question. It took me quite a while, I think, to realize that the more, this is just my opinion, mm -hmm. but the more real you are as a person, the more people can relate to you. And I mentioned that I was had 12, 13 types of personalities inside of me trying to figure out which one I wanted to be when, and it sounds so Hollywood cornball, but the voice inside of me that I was trying to be was in there all along. It just took years to come out, years, years to figure out that it was always there. And you just had to go through uh, the ups and downs and the curves before you finally found yourself. And I think when you find yourself in this business, particularly now, the more relatable you are and the more real you are, the better you are and people will flock to that. You know, I, for years now, I've never, I haven't been afraid to, you know, to sort of tackle the tough things. I haven't been afraid to, you know, give up my personal life and, uh, which, you know, wasn't rosy and, you know, sure, I'm a, I'm a strong, I have strong stance on anti bullying and, and also, uh, you know, child abuse and also a, 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 a proud, proud, um, volunteer for Make a Wish. And when I say volunteer, happy to help them raise money on a yearly basis. So, you know, when you get attached to those things, and you start telling your story, you realize that, you know, you're not alone and everybody's out there with you. And to me, that's not Oprah every day, but it's just being a real person, being something affects you, let it affect you. If something uh, makes you laugh, then by all means laugh. Cry, by all means. Like, it's just the closer to a human being you can be, the better. Done any television, I know you said you were mainly a radio guy and are still, but mm -hmm. did you have any aspirations just for the heck of it to get into television while you were on the radio? Yeah, I think everybody did. Everybody in the radio wanted to be in television. I didn't. Yeah, I guess. But you know what? I didn't uh, pursue it. I got lucky, and it, it started out as a joke. When I was in Regina, there was a, um, a notice posted on the bulletin board that CBC, uh, the People's Network, uh, was working on a show, a Battle of the Bands type show. And each province, uh, the capital city of each province, would have two shows on the national scale and each show, and they would duke it out, there'd be a panel of judges and whatever, and then that winner would go on to the finals and nationals and whatever, and they would be, the show was called The Fame Game, and they would be the winner of The Fame Game. So really early, sort of, American Idol type thing. And they were looking for a host, and I was reading it out loud, and our afternoon guy at the time, his name was Dave Mitchell, walked by, and he said, what are you laughing for? And I said, well, this thing, like, there's no way I'm doing this. And Dave said, hey, look, I'm going to do it, and if I'm going to do it, you should go do it. So we both had a good laugh about it, and then I said, sure. And then uh, I went to the audition, and uh, <laughs> But you know what? Here's the great thing about being young and stupid, and that is that you're young and stupid, and nothing scares you, really. You're like, yeah, for a lot of people, yeah, sure, man, let's give that a try. I don't care if I'm no good at it, you know, and I've always kind of been that way. So I sat down, and the audition was you had to stare into this camera. There's a woman sitting on a chair with a stopwatch, and she said, I need you to stop, or I need you to talk nonstop for five minutes or anything that you want to, but you can't take any pauses. You can't do it. You just got to go for five minutes. So I went, sure. And because I love radio, I talked about getting into radio, what I liked about radio, and so on. And I just kept talking and talking and talking. And then I finally said, okay, and I guess that's it. And she stopped the watch, and it was, <laughs> I'll never forget, four minutes and 57 seconds. So I, and I, I guess the producer of that show, same day, Steve Blackman, who I'm still in touch with, barely, but still in touch, really good guy, told me the next day, and he said, the job's yours. And then that led to, I hosted that show, that was a national show, and then it led to... The producer of a video rock video journal show called Good Rockin' Tonight out of Vancouver, Ted Gibson, saw what I was doing, and he was losing a host at the time and asked if I'd be interested in auditioning for his. And then the next thing you know, I'm doing that for another 10 seasons. So really, just the luck of the draw and just being young and stupid, you know, it's funny. It's funny you can act, provided you don't go on the wrong side of young and stupid, you can actually, you know, I'm here to tell you, you can probably get a few places. Had you seen Good Rockin' Tonight prior to your involvement? Yeah, yeah, and I hated. I um, I didn't like you know, I didn't like videos because I thought videos were ruining the imagination of listening to a song on the radio. And I know quite a few people share that opinion. I used to think, no man, it's like I love this song. This song is called, you know, boy and girl or whatever. And I have this vision of what the boy looks like and what the girl looks like, and that's my vision. That's my thing. But then you put that picture on TV and tell me this is what I'm supposed to be imagining when this song is playing, and I'm like, no man, that, that's not good. And then you'd watch it, you know, the whole concept of videos, although I watched a lot of them, the whole concept uh, became who could, who could really go over the top with something absolutely ridiculous or just a performance video. And I didn't like any of it. But 
they were paying some money, and I thought, you know, I was broke all the time. So I thought, wow, I mean, this is a great opportunity, not only for a career, but more than anything. I was happy to get a boost and some money, so that was it. And then, after, as soon as you get involved in it, you realize there's so much more to the industry than than what meets the eye. And, uh, and I was so over my head. I was so in over my head. But again, young and stupid to the rescue. And, you know, I just kept making it up as I went along and learned and made mistakes and all of that stuff but still managed to turn it into a second career. So I'm forever grateful for the opportunity. But it's, as I said earlier, <laughs> it's crazy how things happen. And what do you think they saw in you that made them eager to use you as the host? Well, you know, I have blonde curly hair. There's nothing wrong with that, which I don't have anymore at all. I guess for Ken, the producer, Ken liked my energy. And I, I did have a lot of it. And I also, I had a, I'd like to think I had a good sense of humor. Um, I, I wrote the scripts as well as research. So I was familiar with music and, you know, kind of grew up with that. So I was familiar with artists and stuff. And I, uh, and I could do an interview. Um, you know, in the early going, I wasn't very good. I had to really, cause it, a television interview, unlike the thing that, that, uh, you know, we're doing over the phone right now, as you know, when you do a face to face, it's a totally different sort of ball game. And, and if you have somebody that's not particularly cooperative, that's a skill to try and, you know, get them to say what you need or get what you need. And it can go sideways really, really fast, as I'm sure you know. But I, I think just that sort of under all that umbrella was a guy who was pliable and willing to learn and already had, I guess, sort of the raw goods. And I think that's what Ken saw in me. For someone who may never have seen it, could you describe the basic format for each episode of Good Rockin' Tonight? Sure. Yeah, it was a, uh, we kind of branched out to some different things along the way, but at its core, we called it a rock journal. So it was a video show. We would play videos. We would do interviews with the artists and then lead into their latest videos. We did kind of a, it had a game aspect to it where we did trivia. The, I would be interviewing, say, you know, I don't know, Rush. And at the end of the interview, we'd say, hey, look, we've got Rush's latest album plus uh, their latest uh, video and their latest blah, blah, blah. If you want to win a copy autographed by Rush, answer this trivia question. And then we'd have the group give the trivia question. And this is all mail in, and it was like, man, I should mean, I still have the letters from those days, and they used to then flood in, like I mean, flood. It's like the country was starving for this stuff. Uh, so we had that aspect of it, uh, the interviews, and then as the show went on, it kind of branched out to different things. I would go on movie junkets, and so we would, uh, movie companies would say, okay, where uh, Beverly Hills Cop Two is opening, you want to come down and see the premiere, interview Eddie, and then we would present a package like that at one part in the show, and then we would do specials as well. Um, we spent a week in the UK interviewing artists from sun up to sundown and attending the British Music Awards. Uh, and so we'd have a British special and then an award special. At the end of the year, we would have the year's best. Like, it was basically, I think Rock Journal was a good description. Interviews, artists, prizes, and just good information and, and chart countdowns as well. Top 20 singles, top 20 albums. It was really, if you go online, uh, there is a, um, a YouTube site called ST40 or STV40. Uh, Ken Gibson still monitors it, my producer of Good Rockin', and it's got all of those shows plus all the other stuff he used to do for CBC. You get an idea there. It's pretty fascinating. And were you still working at CJME at the time when you started? Yeah, that was a hell of a that was a hell of a journey. I um, so I was doing the midday show Monday to Friday, then I would fly out Saturday morning to Vancouver from Regina, check into a hotel Sunday, uh, or go to the CBC for a read through. Then Sunday we'd record the show. Sunday afternoon I'd be on a plane back to Regina again and start it all over. And then of course that took its toll after a while, and but I got it. I just decided to move out to Vancouver permanently, even though CBC wasn't offering anything long term. I thought, well, I'll just try my hand at radio. I'll get a radio in Vancouver, and then at least have something to fall back on. And that turned out to be not a good plan because <laughs> there were no opportunities for me to radio. And I still wasn't really good enough yet, I think, for the big city. So, you know, that was a bit of an eye-opener for me. And then, uh, so I stayed in Vancouver for a couple of years. And then I was offered a job to do the morning show in Edmonton, Alberta, <clears throat> one province away. And, of course, I couldn't resist that. I wanted to get back into radio. Couldn't do it in Vancouver. So I thought we'll do it in Edmonton. So my, And then by this time, I picked up a kids' show called Switchback, which is live on Sunday. So my week was Monday to Friday morning, Friday afternoon, fly to Vancouver. Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon, take the show, Good Rockin'. Sunday, do a live kids show, then get on a plane and <laughs> back to Edmonton and do it all over again. It was kind of a mess for the longest time, but I, again, here comes Young and Stupid. We're just, let's do it. Let's give it our best shot. And when did you sleep during that time, if at all? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, right? No, not much. And I, I, you're getting up at four to do the morning show, and, you know, which I just remember, I was always 
napping, and you get to this level of fatigue that you can function to, which is kind of cool. You realize your limits, and you can still do stuff. And also, you know, again, young, if somebody said, why don't you give that a try today, would be like, no way. I'd last a week. If I lasted a week, that'd be, it'd be the death of me. But, you know, you've got the energy to get through it. And also, there was some romance attached to it, right? It was a very jet-setting lifestyle. Like, it felt like, a, and, you know, oh, yes, I got to fly to Vancouver to interview so-and-so and so-and-so, and then I'm going to L.A. to do a movie junket that weekend. And I'm like, you know, flying all over the place, being this big shot. So it was kind of cool. What are some of your favorite moments from when you were the hell, when you were attached to Good Rock and Tonight, or favorite guests? You know, favorite guests, easy. Um, Paul McCartney. I will never forget when I got this job. The Regina, a newspaper in Regina, the Leader Post, uh, did a story on me that I was now the new host of this national show, and I, I was asked, "What artist, you know, do you would you really like to talk to?" I said immediately, Paul McCartney, and then Martin Knopfler from Dire Straits, who I'm just huge fans of. Uh, so we had a producer coming into my office at CBC in Vancouver saying, uh, we're flying out to Montreal on the weekend. We're going to interview Paul McCartney. We've got 20 minutes with him. And God, I may have soiled myself. That was like the most amazing thing. He was seven levels of awesome. And I remember Ken and I were in my hotel room and we're trying to come up with questions uh, to ask him. And, you know, Ken is saying, well, obviously, we've got to talk about the Beatles. And I'm like, oh, man, that guy, that's all he ever talked about. He's probably sick and tired of it. I bet if we bring up the Beatles question, he's going to leave the room. And we're just like, well, how do we get around it? Because we do need it. And, you, and there's nothing like a Beatle talking about the Beatles. So we worked on our this question, that question, whatever. I forget what my first question was to him. But I remember he took that question, answered it, and basically did a full circle tour of the Beatles all the way up to present time. Him and Montreal on the Flowers and the Dirt tour. And I was never more appreciative and more... I was in such admiration of a guy with a skill like that uh, and who has done this countless of times to be able to make it sound like, oh, that's a good question. I'll answer that for you. And, and yet he's answered it a million times before. And I just had this newfound respect for him, and it was great. And I remember he's answering this question, and I'm nodding my head while I'm listening. But all I'm thinking in my head is, oh, my God, it's Paul McCartney. Holy shit. i got to remember to get a picture. Oh, my God. And Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits, I got a chance to talk to him when they came through on the On Every Street tour in Vancouver. And, man, it was just, he was also tremendous. And, you know, for the most part, everybody that I talked to were very, especially in the early days, were really nice to me because they knew that I was new. I was taking over from a TV veteran who knew what he was doing, and I was just learning. And with very few exceptions, all had kind of I held my hand as I went through this, and as I got better, it, it, it was because of them that I was able to get better. They, they were, they were almost like new friends. Say, yeah, sure, we'll help you out. And again, with very few exceptions, there were there were some that were, you know, not nice. But for the most part, McCartney and uh, and Knopfler at the top, that they're like a million artists that have been uh, so very cool to me over the years. So, but any humorous moments or anything that I know it was a taped program, but did anything ever go wrong in the tapings? No, it was always, uh, Good Rockin', I don't think so. It was always Switchback, because that was a live kid show. And it was a blast. And a friend of mine uh, would watch, uh, it was broadcast, not nationally, but it was broadcast throughout British Columbia and Alberta. And he said, he lived in Edmonton at the time, and he said, man, I used to get up with my kids <laughs> turn on the TV just to see the big guy go nuts, his exact words. And it was just crazy stuff, very mad. And lots of giveaways and lots of fast moving, you know, tons of green screen and just general stupidity. And it had a live audience and the kids loved it and I loved it. Just so much fun. And I remember we were, this sounds like this at the time. So it's 1980, let's say 85, 86. We're giving away this prize and it's a video phone. So it is one of the very first, you needed to have it at your end. I would have the video phone at my end. I would call your number and you and I could see each other on the screen. And this was like, huge, but heaven and earth had to come together to get this freaking thing to work. I mean, it was, first of all, there was only one in the world, I'm sure, and we had it, and I don't think it was really tested out that well, and we're calling this person on the video phone, we've given them one, and we're calling this person so we can show it off, and this person's dad, dad answers, this is live TV, and I'm looking for, i will never forget, I'm looking for the girl's name is Kelly, and I said, hi, is Kelly there? <laughs> he looks right into the screen and says, who the fuck is Kelly? And <laughs> this is a live TV kid show. I'm like, oh my God. You could hear the entire audience go silent. And then in kid fashion, it was like somebody farted and everybody laughed, right? It was the most fun. And yet, the big, could have potentially the biggest disaster ever. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and, I'll, and you know, I was around people that, you know, knew what they were doing. And 
it was so awesome to feel that experience around you because together we handled it, got a good laugh out of it, and moved on. But <laughs> let's look at this guy's face. Very first talk into a video phone. State of the art, folks. <laughs> this guy dropped an F bomb. Did you guys get fined for that? I don't think so, no. And it's one of, you know, the CRTC are, can be tough, but the CRTC are also really cool. Like they kind of understand the elements that go into things that sometimes, you know, shite happens. You actually, how did you get hired at Switchback? You talked about it, but we, you didn't quite talk about the beginning. Do you remember how you got that job? The host of that show prior to me quit. I can't remember. Quit, let go. I really don't remember. Um, and uh, they asked if I wouldn't mind because I was in town. So they asked. And I said, sure. And God, from the very first time I did the first show, the producer, Herb Berry, who was an amazing guy, we did the show. It was 90 minutes then and live. And it was over as soon as it started. But it just seemed to go by so fast. And he came up to me after the show was over, and he was vibrating. He was so happy. Like, he was just, had this huge smile on his face, and he could just tell that he was, like, I had given all the energy I possibly could into that show, and it's like everybody sucked it up. And it was just so cool. He asked what I consider doing it, and I'm sort of like, yeah, sure, let's go. And that was one thing that that show helped me with, and it was my relationship with kids, which I think is still really strong today. I was determined to make sure the kids were never made fun of on that show, to make sure the kids were never embarrassed, to make sure that they were always felt like they were welcome and that we weren't here to make fun of them. We were here to celebrate them. And I was here to be just as old as they were. I was gonna, I'm was i quite happy being an immature eight-year-old kid. And I learned that from that show. And to this day, I carry that with me. I, you know, No kid ever gets hurt or embarrassed in my presence. And, um, and I'm pretty proud of that. So you were doing all four. You were doing four different jobs at once. You did. did you <laughs> yeah. Uh, good rock and night switch back at what point did you uh did you start to fall back on that and did you start to subsidize your work schedule yeah i look back on that time and it wasn't good i mean i i was hard it seemed like i was hardly there it was 1987 the stock market had crashed that year um uh, the oilers had traded wayne gretzky which was just like you know killing the king and i was at a station you know that was at the forefront of that and was a very highly rated station but i just couldn't do it and there were you know there were times i'd be in vancouver just about to get on the plane and i'm like no i can't and i would phone god bless our program director there neil edwards i would phone him all the time we would go out for coffee i'd be crying i'd be going i just can't do this anymore can i get an extra day off or whatever and then you know you started to feel around the station you're working at that they're starting to feel you're putting forth you know all that you should and they're right um, I'm hired, I'm paid by them, I gotta do the job. I took the job, so I gotta do it. And, um, I just couldn't go. And so it really kind of came to, you know, Neil calling me in after the show was over and saying, you know what, um, I don't think it's working and here's your last check and thanks for your help and <laughs> see you down the road. So if I could go back in time, I would like to fix that and, and do a better job. But in reality, it was becoming nearly impossible. Do you remember when you were hired at CKXY in Vancouver? Yeah, yeah. And that, uh, <laughs> Here's young and stupid again. I'm sitting in Vancouver with a legend, um, radio announcer. Uh, and Red uh, was not managing me, but was kind of helping me along. And he used to write this column in the back of TV Week magazine uh, about sort of the industry and how he sees it. And he put up this thing in his, in his story about why isn't anybody in Vancouver hiring Stu Jeffries? The guy is a national TV host. He's got radio experience. What the hell is going on? And Paul McKnight, who was the program director at CKXY, read this and went, yeah, that's right. Why don't we hire him? So we asked, we asked if I'd do mornings, and I said, sure. They were, it was the last sort of gap for AM radio in Vancouver. Uh, CKLG was the reigning champion uh, on AM, and CKXY, or 1040 Kicks, as they were called, was the new kid on the block, playing exactly the same music, announcers that were a little more, you know, hyper. And now they had a national TV host to do their morning show, so they thought things would be, you know, great, and they weren't. Um, it's just for any number of reasons. I still look back on those days and, you know, recall that I wasn't, I still wasn't ready. I had, first of all, too much going on, very little focus, and I thought I had an idea of what I was doing, and I was trying to execute that, and it wasn't a very good idea, and it wasn't a good plan. And I, I was getting tired. I was getting tired of everything, so I, I would hate to say that I was, I didn't, I don't say I was difficult to work with. But I will say that I think people found it harder and harder to get stuff out of me because I just, you know, I had reached my limit. And what, do you remember what year that was that you got hired? Yeah. So CKXY was 88, I think, 88 or 89. And I was there until 90, maybe 91 or something like that. And then um, Good Rock and ended around 92, 93. And then I kind of just sort of inched my way back into Vancouver radio after that through various stops and various formats. And then, um, I uh, got the opportunity to come out to Toronto when I didn't pass it up. You mentioned the show ended in 93. 
good rocket mm-hmm. tonight. One, when did you find out that it would be ending? And two, how did you feel when you found out it was going to end? Well, I guess, um, you know, there's a certain element of I, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And, you know, you start thinking, wow, like the show I've been doing for, the show lasted 10 seasons, which I think is still the longest. Uh, one of the longest variety shows the CBC's had, so I'm very proud of that. I was there for eight and a half of those years, or eight and a half of those seasons. And I, you know, I was, I became sort of, well, what, I'm not going to go to movie junkets anymore. I'm not going to be doing interviews anymore. I guess this is an opportunity now to sort of, con- you know, continue my passion, which has always been radio. But man, I'm, it's going to be weird. And it was. I remember, like, movie trailers would come out on TV, you know, on commercial here, this movie's coming up, and I would think, yeah, I'd be on that junket. Yeah, I'd be flying over there. Yeah, I'd be interviewing that guy. And it was weird for a bit, but then it was kind of like a little bit of relief. It was like, I, it, it was, I had a great run, nothing to be ashamed about, and I learned a lot. So it was really good. And I found out the head of Variety, who I think was George Anthony at the time was based in Toronto, came out to <laughs> out Vancouver, and we all kind of knew. <laughs> it was sort of like he wanted to meet with us, and we're like, yeah, here it comes. And then he said, you know, as of blah, 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 uh, we're going to take good rocking off the air. So that was that. What do you remember about that final show? Uh, the final show was great. We got to have a little fun, and I brought my dog on with me. Broadway's a bearded collie. She was awesome. She sat on the couch with me, and I remember getting choked up saying goodbye at the end. And then the sort of the letters and stuff that followed, the people going, no, and the support and everything. It was, it was really kind of cool. But I felt, I remember just saying those last words, and I felt really proud. Like, really, really proud of how far I had come and how far the show had come and that I was a key part of it. And also, picked up a massive amount of television experience. Should I ever have to fall back on that again, I, I wouldn't be afraid to and wouldn't hesitate to give it a shot. But to have that opening again, go down and pursue radio full time, I was, I was all in. So after Good Rock tonight, what was the score? A half hour sports show, the, the focus was on local sports and it would run, as you know, hockey is huge in this country. So one of the things that um, CDC was into was a double header hockey game on the West Coast. The first one would start at four o'clock Pacific time, so seven Eastern. And then that would be followed up with a second game. So they called it a hockey double header. And the score was on as a sort of local commitment after the second game. So it would air about 10.30 Pacific time. And it was basically just to focus on BC local sports, who was making the news. We would have a co-host uh, that would be, you know, a, a person in British Columbia that was of note in the sporting world to do a quick interview with. And then we would have a uh, special guest fan, it was called, who would be watching the second double header game and picking highlights. So we would go at one point to the game for, you know, and so it was kind of an odd sort of thing, but sort of funny. I think, you know, maybe 12 people watched it, but it was, uh, it was again, really funny to do. And then it got me into that different thing where I thought, hey, maybe I should try sports for a bit until I found out that, you know, for the most part, it's a bit of a grind. <laughs> it's not for me. I think I wanted to be a sports anchor only if somebody would do all the writing and editing for me and just let me do the talking. That would be awesome. But that's, I don't think that job exists. Best of luck finding it. <laughs> really. When were you hired at CKLG? Uh, that was almost right after, uh, Good Rockin' had come to a close. And CKLG, as I mentioned earlier on, were like the powerhouse music station. They were making a change to an ill-advised change that turned out to talk radio. But they wanted to kind of a talk music hybrid, but also not standard talk radio, not stodgy political stuff, but more kind of new agey. There was really no definition to it, but it was kind of, it was kind of like throw everything into this pot, give it a big stir, and see what we come up with. So yeah, I had a, a brief experience with talk radio, and I um, I knew real probably pretty early that it wasn't for me. When it got intense, it was too much for me. I couldn't leave it at work, and there were times where I'd be listening to somebody's story, and you know, I could feel tears coming and feel like I, I I'm losing sort of perspective on this. And and also, you're plugged into so much of the world, and there was so much oh, just so much crap going on that it, you can only take so much, right? And talk radio has my utmost respect for what they have to deal with on the daily. There is always something, and it's usually not good, that they have to deal with, and it's four or five, six different hosts, four or five, six different shifts, and they all have to bring their own angle on it, and it's what everybody's talking about. So my hat goes off to them. It's just something I couldn't do. Were you still recognized regularly from your time of Good Rock in the Night? And if so, do you have any interesting reactions or interactions, rather, with fans or viewers? And it's still, you know what, it, it makes me, today, it it happens more than it did back then. And I love that. One, for, you know, I mean, I, I think I look totally different, but people still recognize you. And today, it's mind-blowing because people, I, you know, people talk about how important that show was to them, especially people that used to live up north or in small towns in the, in the prairies or whatever that only got a couple of television stations. And that was their plug-in to what was going on.
going on musically in the country uh, every Friday night. And they would talk about if they were going out, they would tape it and they would come back and watch it when they got home. And it was such a key part of their life. And, you know, they start throwing things around like icon and, and legend and they're just part of my life. Uh, expert, I get that a lot. And I realized quickly that you get all those titles because you get older. And <laughs> you get older, they spill around. People will lay a title on you. But now, so getting recognized now for that, it just, God, it fills my heart. Because I wouldn't even, I don't know if I, it wasn't that I didn't appreciate it when I got recognized before. It just didn't make any sense to me. People would be kind of excited and nervous, and then that would make me nervous, and it would always be really kind of awkward. And, of course, I'd try to be as nice as I possibly could to everybody, you know, and not everybody would be nice, you know. Some people would be, uh, like, you know, we were walking down the street one time in Vancouver on Coranville, in between two stores, and I was really excited because I was going to go pick up a hockey jersey I couldn't wait to get a hold of. And as I'm walking between two stores, somebody yells, hey, Jeffries, and I turn around, <laughs> and I'm looking right at him, and he goes, you're a prick, <laughs> and keeps walking. And I'm like, okay, wow, awesome, that's really cool. Or some people would come up to you and say, you know what, you don't make the show better if you weren't on it. <laughs> but yeah, I find now it happens more than it did then, which I think is funny, And uh, but also I feel... On some level, what was done was important to people, and that, to me, is that's mind-blowing. Do you remember when you first met Blair Murdoch? Yes, Blair did uh, a series, among other things. God, he's a funny guy, good guy. He uh, did a bunch of game shows, and he called them meatball game shows. It was basically, I do what I do, I mass-produce game shows, I try and do it as cheaply as possible, then I run them forever and a day on whatever network wants to pick them up. And I, that's how I'm making the money. And I'm, I know that's not the only way he was, but he loved it. You could tell he loved doing TV and, and the game show aspect. So everything was a takeoff of what you already know, a newlywed game or a, a charades, you know, whatever. He would just call it, give it a different title, but basically do the same kind of thing. Blair came up to me to do a, sh- a game show called Love Hand, uh, which was the newlywed game, except this one was the very first show to feature uh, same-sex couples. And he was telling me about it. I thought, okay, that sounds great. It's almost kind of, you know, semi-historic. So I, <laughs> he gave me the concept of the show, and would I be interested in hosting? I had already done some work for him. Um, I know you've spoken with Wayne Cox, who is a, uh, uh, a, a game show host, among other things. He's a really good game show host. He hosted Acting Crazy, and Blair had me on as a guest one time, so that's when I first met him. And I guess he liked what he saw in terms of what I offered and wanted to know if I would host this show. So I said, sure, and I'll never forget the conversation we had when it came down to the contract. He gave it to me, and I had a look over it, and I said, okay, I just... I got a couple of questions, and whatever the questions were, he answered. And he goes, is that it? I said, yeah. He said, okay, is this sign there on that dotted line? And that sound you hear is your career be flushed down the toilet. <laughs> I want to work for this man. This is awesome. So, yeah, so we recorded a million of those in one month. And then I found myself back to what I was doing. I'm doing the morning show at LG. who have gone back to music now. And then right after I'm off the air, I go to uh, CKBU TV studios in Vancouver, and we record six shows and then do it all over again Monday to Friday and do it for the entire month until it's all done. And there was somebody still come on TV now. Uh, the Pride Network picked it up, which I'm very proud of. And I watch me, and I'm like, who is that guy? Like, I don't remember anything about it, but I do remember having fun. And then we did a couple of my other shows together, too, one called Million Dollar Ice Picks, which is basically a hockey pool show with four sports guys and me as a host, and that was also fun. And this guy... Blair, to me, this is the thing, and if you can imagine this, he, when I was hosting Love Hand, he would go behind the camera. He would have, if he didn't get the answer that he was looking for from one of these contestants, he would throw his arms in the air. They couldn't see him. Only I could see him. And he'd be shaking his head back and forth like, this is the worst garbage I've ever seen. And it was up to me to keep a straight face and to keep things moving. And he knew he was doing it. And it was so, so funny. And he, he's a guy I'm still in touch with. He is a guy that I take a bullet for him. He, if ever he needed me again, I'd be there because I, it is guaranteed it is the most fun you'll ever have doing television and some of the strangest stuff. But he is, yeah, he's still one of my favorite people. Could you describe the format? I know you said it was like the newlywed game, but could you give just a basic rundown of what the format of Love Handles was? Yeah, so you get a couple uh, that would come out, three couples, and uh, one would go into the uh, soundproof isolation booth while I'd ask the questions of, of the remaining uh, person. And then the uh, person in the soundproof isolation booth would come back, and I would ask the same questions. And if they got a match, it would certain points. And at the end, <laughs> the other thing, too, this show had the worst prizes for the contestants. Like, I mean, the worst. 
Uh, we would give away contestants on the show playing love handles. Each received like this coffee mug that's got love handles on it and a, and a ring of sausage from some meat company. And um, the grand prize was a $100,000, is it a barn? I don't know. But anyway, it was, it was impossible. You could not win it. Like, you could not. Heaven and Earth had to come together for you to win this $100,000 bond. And during commercial breaks, the contestants would actually make fun of it. One of the guys said, no, I'm just here for the coffee cup and the sausage. <laughs> I love this. Love it. Did anyone come close to getting a perfect match? Yeah, I remember. I don't know how close, but fairly. And then I, uh, you know, I don't know what happened. Something in the final round did them in, and, and that was that. And Blair was insured for it, so he didn't, you know, if he had to give it away, he wasn't really concerned. But And I, I don't think it was, ever was, there was never a plan to make it so ridiculously difficult, but it was just everything had to line up. You had to get, you know, two rounds of questions right, perfect match on each round, and then the lightning round and all of that. And with TV playing a factor in nervousness, there was just no way it could happen. At the beginning of every show, you would be introduced mm -hmm. by the announcer, David Kay, and he would give you a different right. sort of title each time. What do you remember about that? And what do you remember about David Kay? <laughs> David Kay is another one of my most favorite people. Uh, by his own admission, David said that uh, the voice for uh, Love Handle, that he would do anything for 50 cents at the time. He was just like, yep, sure, I'm in. What do you got? I want a voice. Over. And now he's like one of the foremost voiceover guys in the world doing like, and character voices that are just amazing. And he used to do, and I used to love this. It's one of the things I loved about the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson back in the day. Ed McMahon would introduce Johnny. And then Johnny, over to Ed, would do the, you know, have the hands in sort of prayer and do a little bow to Ed McMahon and thank him for the introduction. And I used to think that was so cool to be introduced and then bow to the guy who introduced you. So David and I did that all the time. And he would give me a new name every time I came up on stage. So I, the one I remember still to this day is, and now, this hundred odd of us, you just me. And said he got me giving him a bow, he bows back, and it was just like, it's awesome. We still, you know what? I'm convinced if we saw each other today, we'd do exactly the same thing. Let me know how that goes. I kind of want that thunder <laughs> god of romance. <laughs> and they were made up, correct? Every time? Oh, yeah. All the time. All the time. You brought up the uh, fact that Love Handles was the one of the first shows to have gay couples as contestants. How yeah. was homosexuality depicted in Canada at that time, if at all, in terms of television? Well, we're... I just don't think there was an outlet for it in terms of, you know, nobody actively sought out same-sex couples, I think, for as contestants or whatever. But Vancouver and British Columbia has always been at the forefront of gay rights, and it it wasn't even a second thought. It was more like, well, let's look so long, and then open the floodgates, and let's see if everybody else picks up on this and, and you know, maybe sort of falls in line with it. It, what was good about it was I don't think anybody from Blair on down thought, you know, that we're doing anything special. And yet, as it turned out, we were the only ones that were doing it. So I guess, in fact, it was. But And I love that, though. Nobody thought anything of it. It's just like, yeah, well, you know what? They're not represented at a uh, – you never see that happen on the New Way game. And they're, they're here, so why don't we represent them as well? And it worked out well. Did you ever host any game shows subsequent to Love Handles? You know, there was a show pilot, a kid's show called Secrets Out that never, that never saw the light of day. Um, and this is funny you ask that because I'm, I'm thinking right now, going, have I missed something? And, and every so often somebody says, hey, you remember when you did this show? And I'm like, oh yeah, right, I forgot. I don't think so. I think that was pretty much the only one. And I was a guest on Acting Crazy, so that would be my extent of it. If I find anything, I'll bring it up to you someday. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Email. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing I know you remember, country music television. Um, how did you get hired at CMT? CMT is actually connected with my, uh, with my lovely wife, Anne. CMT happened while I was in Vancouver and working for LG. And the general manager of CMT was uh, Vicky Delzell. And Vicky and her husband, John, were friends of mine. Vicky took over after um, Shaw Cable had bought CMT, and they were looking to do some local programming. And so one of the shows was called CMT Central, I think. No, whatever it was. It was basically an hour-long or a two-hour-long show about country music featuring artists and interviews and so on, much like I did on Good Rockin'. Except it was more on location type stuff. So I'd fly out to Calgary on the weekend and do that for a whole day. And then they'd have a week's worth of shows. And then I'd fly out the next week and do that. And it was country. So it was out of my uh, comfort zone. I wasn't really familiar with country music. But little did I know that that would lead to a move to uh, Toronto and the opportunity to meet my first and only wife. And now uh, we're still together some uh, 21 years later with three boys. And, you know, the whole ball started rolling. So I credit Vicky 
and uh, TNT for putting Ann and I together, and uh, and also for you know prolonging my TV career. Congratulations on that. On Thank your you. Happy family. But in that note, what moments from hosting CMT stand out to you? Garth Brooks, for one. Garth Brooks did a show called uh, Seven. Uh, TMT was hosting it, and it was to uh, promote Garth's album, Seven. And he would fly. We'd get on a plane with Garth, a bunch of media, and fly from you know city to city to city, major cities in Canada, where he would basically just show up. There'd be press everywhere. He played the sizzle reel, and then he'd walk out on stage, and people would go nuts, ask him a bunch of questions. We'd get on the plane and keep flying west until we got to Vancouver, where we'd host an hour-long show called Sevens with Garth Brooks. And it was one of those things. I sat next to him. Uh, nobody was talking to him on the bus taking us to the plane. Nobody was talking to him. So I just started talking to him, and he started talking back because he's a good dude. And the next thing you know, it was like we became buds. We're, we sat together on the plane. In between his interviews on the plane, you come back, sit down, we tell jokes, joke around, talk. It was like really cool. Very cool, man. So certainly a highlight would be to talk to him. And also, for me to open up my uh, musical window, as a country I didn't really give a fair shot to, and CMT helped me along with that. And I'm so appreciative of that because there's so, I ended up working for a country station in Toronto uh, called Country 95.3 with my good friend Colleen, and we uh, did the morning show there. And it was, I say musically, three of the best years of my life. It was like we were let into this club that's been there all along, but you had to have, you know, a membership card. And I just fell in love with the format and fell in love with the people and the artists. Having come from rock and roll, which is all about attitude, to country, which is all about how can I help you, it is like night and day. I'll never forget my first experience with that. We had an interview set up with Vince Gill. And for whatever reason, Vince was supposed to call, say, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And he didn't. Something went wrong and didn't hear from him. So I didn't think anything of it. It happens in rock all the time. Guys just don't show up. So the very next day, I come into work, I'm on my voicemail. I'm checking my voicemail. I go, hey, Sue, it's Vince Gill. Buddy, I am so sorry I missed the call yesterday. Here's my whole phone number. <laughs> phone number. And everyone goes like, call me when you get a second. I'm really, really sorry. And I'm like, that to me summed up country music and country music artists. Because that, that's exactly what it is. How can I help you? And what can we do together to make to lift each other up? Was CMT the first time you ever worked in Toronto? Uh, yeah. Um, I, when I came out, when I left Vancouver for uh, Toronto, it was uh, actually a radio station in Burlington. Oh. It's outside of Toronto. Uh, and, but they're broadcast uh, at this particular station, Energy 108, uh, broadcast into Toronto. They were strong enough to get there. So I got uh, Burlington and thought, because you know my goal has always been to do a morning show in Toronto, I'm not letting go of this idea. Uh, they had a signal strong enough to get into the city, but it didn't work out. We were being just massacred by a, uh, a pop station that was in Toronto proper, so we just couldn't compete. So I ended up going out to Hamilton, which was a little farther out uh, from Toronto, about an hour and a bit. And I didn't want to do that, but I figured it's still out there. I still got to make the move. Eventually, I'll get my shot. And it was funny. I, I was doing a, working at a classic rock station doing mornings when the offer came for this new country station. Um, they thought I'd be a great fit. I'm already a national host on that network, so I went up to um, uh, Toronto's country uh, station. So I did, and with my good friend Colleen, we did that for three years. <laughs> Again, it didn't work. Um, it got me to Toronto. Uh, it got me noticed. Uh, in Toronto, and then um, things sort of picked up from there. Yeah, it was it was like almost surreal because it was the goal that had come through finally. And although Country 95.3 had studios in Toronto, people still classified them as a Burlington station. So, you know, there was always that lingering in the background. And while doing Country, uh, I was approached by program director of 97.3 Easy Rock, which was a light rock station, and asked if uh, I'd be interested in doing mornings there. And that was legit Toronto. So, and they were successful too. Like they were a good, they were a powerhouse station. And I said, yep. Uh, and then, so to be able to do that again with my friend Colleen, we hosted that show for three years. We could not get any traction to save our lives. We were up against some pretty good heritage morning shows that were, you know, destroying us. And the key about, what, there's one thing I've learned about radio in terms of, especially if you're trying to get a new morning show going, particularly in a major market, you've got to be patient. There's got to be some sort of traction. There has to be otherwise. You know, it's hard to hang on to, but you've got to be patient. You've got to give it time, and it, it, it can take a while. And I'm here to tell you I've been, you know, part of that. We at, at Boom 97.3, where we're succeeding very well now. This is my eighth or ninth year doing it, mornings. And, you know, it took about five before we really started getting some action. Um, and now we're sitting on top of things, and, and it's a great view. But 
it is a tough, you, you, you get, it's kind of weird because you get your goal. You have your goal. You are now doing morning for the number one station, or at least a top five station and the number one market in Canada. And, you know, you're bringing your game and it's not working. So it's hard because you start to think, maybe it's me. Maybe I can't do this. And I just didn't let go. I'm like, it's radio. I got to tell you something. I've hung on the radio like grim death and I, I'm, I'm glad I've done it. But it has not necessarily treated me very well in the process. Uh, radio owns me, man. But uh, I'm glad I did. Well, you've been hanging on to radio, um, and you've moved somewhat away from television. Uh, you know, VJs, I don't want to say are gone completely, but they're almost a, an almost a bygone ant- antiquity. Why do you think television has moved so far away from the video DJ? Yeah, because I guess, you know, there's just so many other outlets for people to get their fix now. So I, I don't know, you know, it's... It, uh, you know, you hear a new song on the radio from Joe Schmo, and you go, I wonder who Joe Schmo is. Uh, you're not going to say, well, I, you know, I'll make sure that I turn my TV on at 7 o'clock for my favorite music show, and they'll tell me who Joe Schmo is. You don't have to do that anymore. Just pick up your phone and say, who's Joe Schmo? Play me his video. You don't really need us anymore. It's just people have access to all the information they could possibly want right now on anybody and everything. So, you know, that sort of, I want to say that Good Rock for the event television, but that sort of, I've got to take that show or i got to be home in time to watch that show. Those days are gone because we can watch that show anytime we want to. Um, I do love that I was part of it, though. It's exciting. It was a real exciting time and a new time, and suddenly DJs were like really cool people. <laughs> I was like, hey, man, I'm kind of cool. Um, so, you know, I loved it, and I'm so glad I was a part of it, but I totally get why you don't need it anymore. Would you ever consider going back to television? I suppose so, given the kind of you know, given the, the the right opportunity. I'm just, it's just different now. It doesn't really jazz me. It doesn't really get me going. I, I feel like I'm sort of at this point in my career right now where I finally found what I want to do and I'm doing it and, uh, and I've reached my goals and, and now it's just a matter of hanging on and, and I mean that in a good way, hang, hanging on and, and, and enjoying it and enjoying the ride. And I think taking on too much would take away from that. Um, and I, you know what, I, I don't know who'd be interested in watching me anymore. I don't know what I would have to offer that would be particularly interesting to people. People constantly say, good rock and tonight, the reunion, <laughs> which would be me, <laughs> and our producer, I guess. And, you know, maybe revisiting the show and the things that happened on the show. But, you know, it would seem very dated and probably not particularly interesting. So, I guess, yeah, if somebody said, here, yeah, i got a show for you, what do you think? I'd certainly consider it, but it would have to be something that really jazzes me. Now you work for Boom 97.3, one of the most popular stations mm-hmm. in North America. Mm-hmm. Could you describe the average workday for yourself currently at Boom 97.3? Sure. I'm up at uh, 3, between 3 and 3.15 um, in the morning. Well, uh, I'm fortunate to be basically a, a five-minute drive from, from my home station, which is at Young St. Clair in downtown Toronto. Uh, I uh, get up free, grab a cup of coffee, see the uh, overnight uh, to see what's happened. Um, I use my services to prep the show for the day, try and figure out what I'm going to do, where I'm going to put it. Uh, have a look at the music I'm playing, uh, and then uh, once I'm ready with that, I'll, I'll pack up, go to work. Although the last five weeks I've been doing it from home because of the pandemic, but this has been a totally different experience. It was really cool on this on the chain, though. Uh, and then um, I'm, I'm off the air. I'm on the air 5:30 to 9:30. Uh, I'll finish that, do some work on the next day's show at my desk for a bit, maybe leave around 11 o'clock. I'm napping by 12:31. Uh, up, walking the dog at three. Uh, dinner time with the kids, watching TV, and then back to bed again. I'm usually, the one thing I have found, there's no way I'm staying up past 9.30 anymore. <laughs> I just can't do it. So, um, uh, you know, that's a bit of a drag. Because, you know, I mean, well, now it's not so bad because there's no sports on TV, but, you know, the Jays play. I love the Jays. I love the Maple Leafs. And I love watching sports. And, to, you know, I'd love to be able to watch. My biggest thrill these days is there's, if I'm on holiday and I'm not going anywhere, I do Board schedule for the week, and I can stay up and watch that. I can stay up and watch that. It's pretty cool. Uh, but uh, I'm I am totally blessed. I have a happy, healthy family, and uh, and I'm you know not complaining one bit. That's nothing. And the fact that uh, people have I don't know just this last few years in doing this job, people have said some really, really, really nice things to me, and how important the show is to them and me and their lives and stuff. And I've never met these people, and it's just I can't describe to you how that makes you feel. Um, connecting with somebody that you've never met, just like me, you know, looking at that transistor radio, hearing the guy come into my kitchen, you know, I'm that guy now, and it's like, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. Professionally speaking, what is your proudest achievement? Ah, uh, uh, I, I would say, um, and just given what people have said uh, to me over the years, 
I'm proud on the TV. I'm proud of how that show, how Good Rock and um, reach people, and I'm proud of how it made handles in that it opened the doors um, to uh, same-sex couples on TV and didn't even bat an eye. I'm proud of the work I've done with Make a Wish. Uh, I'm proud of the stance I have. Like, I was a bullied kid and had a not a great childhood, and uh, I'm proud of the work that I can do and the, and and what I'm able to do to help kids that need help. Uh, I'm so proud of my family. I love my wife, and I am so proud of my kids and they are just as much a part of what I do right now as anything else. They're with me, you know, wherever I go. And I'm I'm just proud of how, you know, in a lot of ways now I can affect some change. I have a microphone, I reach a lot of people and I don't have to do, you know, the same morning dribble that you hear all the time laughing too loud at jokes that aren't funny and you know, and talking about who's got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And I don't have to do that stuff. You know, I can do I can have fun. And believe me, I'm a goof and I'm as stupid as they come. But I also have a side that, you know, I can affect change by talking about things and initiating conversation. I can do that within the format that I have. And I work with people that trust me to do that uh, and have, have given me the the, least of the the rope to do it. And it's work and it continues to work. And, you know, I said the goal was to be in Toronto and work in uh, do morning for the Toronto radio station. But to be number one at it a few times is like that's surreal and i'm really proud of that because i know that i worked really really hard uh, and did a lot of things um that um that, that a lot of people would have quit and i didn't want to because i love it that much and i'm also proud of the fact that i still love it radio to me <laughs> i told you i've hung on to it like grim death but really in reality it's been in my heart since i was eight years old so so i'm, I'm proud aside from cjme what are some of your biggest disappointments or regrets in terms of your career? I, as I mentioned earlier, I would have liked to have given it a, you know, a better shot in the 80s when I was doing all that traveling, but, you know, I would have liked to have been smarter. You know, I would have liked to have not get caught up in the entertainment aspect so much. <laughs> Just leave it at that. Uh, but, you know, I don't know, man. I, everybody says, you know, you can't have any regrets. Well, yes, you can. You can have a ton of regrets. You can look back and go, yeah, I wish I had done that. I wish I had done that. And yeah, you can say, put it behind you and it'll dissolve and blah, blah, blah. And that's true. You know, but people would be lying if they said, if I could go back and change this thing, I would. For me, I will say this. It was all part of the growing process and it has made me the person I am today. Um, so, and even though I would want to, if somebody said, hey, I got the time machine, let's go back and fix that. I would say, yep, I'm getting the board. Um, I can't. And I will use that and will always be in my mind, the things that I did wrong and the things that I could have done better and things that people I could have been better to, but they've made me who I am today. And I'm actually, I'm okay with who I am today. So, you know, all good. <laughs> what do you see as the future for radio? Yeah, people have been uh, sounding the death knell for radio for years. And, you know, it's like, uh, oh my God, albums are coming out. People are just going to listen to their albums. No one's going to listen to radio. Oh my God, cassettes are out. People can take it with them in their cars. No one's going to listen to radio. Oh my God. Satellite radio. Oh my God. Digital radio. Oh my God. The internet. Uh, oh my God. How is Stern? Like, it's every cycle. There's always a, this is it for radio. Radio's not going to survive. Well, look who's here. Look who's still here. And look who will always be here. As long as there's some sort of local hand that you want to hold. As long as you want some company in the car. And as long as you want that sort of friend to be with you while you do what you do. Uh, or even just a voice in the background to make everything seem normal. And these days, I hear so much of that now. People are so grateful for their radio stations and they to everyone where they say, you know, if it wasn't for you guys, things would be out of control. You guys make it normal. You guys make it seem like life is going on and we're going to be okay. And man, that is powerful stuff. And it has always been here. And I think now, and people notice it, but I think now people really notice how important it is and it's not going anywhere. So we have a lot of access to a lot of different places and a lot of ways we can get our entertainment. But there's something about getting in your car in the morning, going to work, turning on the radio, where you, you've got information at your fingertips and you've got a friend at your fingertips. You've got your favorite music or news or whatever you want. And it's always been there for you. That's why I don't, I don't think it's going anywhere. Was there ever a point when you thought it might go anywhere or where they feared that it was going to go, go away? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, when I was younger, yeah, because, you know, there were always people, um, satellite was supposed to be this huge thing that was going to kill radio. I, I was a little worried about that. And also, a, I was worried about AM. 
and I loved AM radio, and I was fortunate enough to be working in AM when it still had its heyday. It was still more than just a news band, and there was excitement in the air about radio because it was we were talking about sharing every radio station sharing the same digital dial where the sound would be the same on AM and FM. It would just be this clear, clear, crisp digital thing, which is yet to come to fruition uh, unless you listen online. And, you know, I was hopeful for that. And also I was around for AM stereo when they gave that a try, which was hilarious now that I think of it. And I'm killed to have an AM stereo receiver. Which, you know, people were so annoyed when they bought it. It cost like $8 million and did <laughs> not improve the sound whatsoever. But I remember, you know, being excited for that. I don't think I've ever really thought it's not coming uh, or, it's, or it's going away. I, I only thought we have challenges and we got to work hard, but I, I haven't been afraid to work hard. So, Can you talk a little bit about your charity work with Make-A-Wish and your anti-bullying stances? Sure. Make-A-Wish, we've been involved with uh, through the radio station quite a few years now, and um, we're, we're closing in on, we do this thing once a year called the, uh, you know, I have a contest on my show called the Thousand Dollar Minute. Uh, and it's 10 questions, 60 seconds. You get them all right, you win a grand. We play it three times a morning. And at Christmas time, we call it the $1,000 Make-A-Wish Minute. So whatever a contestant plays the contest, whatever money they make, they keep, but we'll match it and put it towards Make-A-Wish to our goal of we always set a goal each year. And uh, the first time we did this, we set a goal for let's grant two wishes because we got started late, and wishes are about 10 grand each. And we ended up granting four. He made 40 grand, and that was great. But I remember walking into my boss's office, and he said, we should be embarrassed. We are like one of the number, we are a top three station in the country. We're number one this past winter book. We should be raising way more than $40,000. And we are kind of like all in agreement. So we went on to really expanded the thousand dollar make a wish minute, started doing a lot more work towards make a wish. And the goals kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year. So in this five, six years that we've been doing it, I think this is the year we are approaching one million. And that, that it, it's like an amazing accomplishment given the time. Like people don't have money, and yet people, this sings to people. It goes right to their heart. And to me, I've met Wish Kids, and I've seen what this organization does. It's like more than a trip to Disneyland. It changes lives. It has helped kids get better. Kids with life-threatening illnesses that get better because of the magic of the Make-A-Wish, to me, it's like, oh, my God, how do I get on board? How can we do more? Again, things to people, it sings to me, and I think that translates on the air. And we've <laughs> we've had some unbelievable donations throughout the year. And uh, when we reach that goal every year, I know that the pandemic has destroyed so many things in this world. People have lost their jobs and so on. But we still play this contest every day, and people still keep giving back the money. Like, it is it's pretty amazing stuff. And bullying, you know, as I mentioned, I remember my bullies very well, and I remember the effect that they had on me. I know that it's not just in the playgrounds. I've seen, you know, what happens in the playgrounds, but it's in the workplace. You know, our leaders, our bullies, it's everywhere. And any chance I get a chance to speak out on that, I will. And share my personal experiences and, you know, and hope that that somehow helps other people get through it. What advice would you have for someone who wanted to work in the world of radio as either a disc jockey, a programmer, or any role for that matter? <laughs> run. <laughs> run while you still can. Um, run toward or run from? <laughs> run from. I'm kidding. Um, you need to love it. You can't, radio's not just, and it's like anything. Radio's not just something, I'm going to give this a try. Like, it's like a comedian. You can't just say, I'm going to try and be a comedian today. It's like, no, I'm going to try and be a firefighter today. You, know, you don't try. You have a passion for it. You want to do it for a reason. Radio's no different than anything else that you're passionate about. But it can break your heart, and you can come up, up, up to any number of setbacks. In it. it can, just when you think you're getting going, you get pulled back. You know, you meet some of the strangest, most interesting, bizarre people in the world. You have to be ready for anything. But more than anything else, you've got to love it. And if you're just kind of half-assed about it, don't bother. And also, no, it owes you nothing. If you get out of it what you put into it, you know, that becomes evidence right off the bat. If you're one of those people that, you know, listen to radio to hear the announcers, listen to radio to time out songs, listen to radio to see execution and hear music blends and mixes and whatever. You've got the passion to pursue it. And don't let, as cornball as it sounds, do not let anybody tell you you can't or you're not any good at it. When you start, you're going to stink, but you get better and you learn. And there are so many people to learn from. It's it, when you do get to where you want to go, wherever that might be in this business, uh, there's nothing like it. So, but you got to be ready. You talked about learning from others, and this this will probably be the, the last question uh, we do. Did you have any mentors uh, when you started out in radio? Uh, no, I I, uh, I had, as I mentioned, I had those 
announcers that I liked, uh, that I tried to sort of steal from. I, I will say this. I had a program director, first of all, in New York, and Gary Lawrence, who hired me. I owe him a, a lot because he really helped me through. Uh, you know, he had a lot of patience that he didn't necessarily have to have, and I didn't deserve it because I was, man, I was cocky. Like, I, <laughs> I thought I had it figured out, man. I thought, why did anybody hire me? I've been doing this for six weeks, and I'm awesome. Uh, when in fact, you know, I was complete garbage. Um, and Gary was patient with me. Jeff Steele was my program director. He hired me in Regina when I made the move from York to Regina. And Jeff, I learned probably the most from in terms of being real, in terms of execution, uh, dedication, and knowing that it's not a half-assed job. And and I, and and also he he pointed out my skills early. He said, "Here's why I hired you." And he said, "And here's what I don't like about you. It's exactly the same thing. You've got great energy." And you are able to talk your way out of most situations, but you have this annoying habit of keeping talking until you finally find a way out. And sometimes it works, and other times it doesn't. you got to work on making it work all the time. Otherwise, shut up. And it was <laughs> really good. And I remember thinking, thanks, man. And he, he really guided me through that time. He gave me a lot of opportunities to show my stuff where normally I don't think other people would have believed in me that much. And then what I learned from him, I just kind of took forward, and, uh, and here I am. Thank you, Stu Jeffries, for telling your story. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the time, Joshua. It's been a lot of fun.